Welcome to chapter one. This is the history of computing. What we want to do is we want to do a little bit of survey of some of the people, the places, the events, the items that have resulted in the technology that as we know it today. And there's a lot of things, some that might be kind of surprising and some things that we may not have heard about that <clears throat> brought about technology as we know it today. So we're going to move all the way back into ancient history with an abacus. And an abacus was a device with sliding beads that was used for addition and subtraction. It allowed us to take mathematics beyond just counting on our fingers and toes or with sticks or with rocks into an actual device. We're going to move to quickly to 1622 with the advent of the slide rule. With the slide rule, we began solving complex mathematical problems with a mechanical device that had moving parts. And before you put your nose up at the idea of a slide rule, just keep in mind that we put a man on the moon with the slide rule. We're going to move to 1642 with a man named Pascal who created a mechanical calculator. It had gears and levers that performed addition and subtraction. And in 1694, Leibniz expanded on Pascal's mechanical calculator by adding multiplication and division. And it was called the Gottfried Leibniz wheel. In 1801, there is a device that may not seem to have anything to do with the history of technology, but it was a loom created by Joseph Jacquard. <clears throat> and as you may or may not know, a loom is a device that was created to weave cloth patterns. And Jacquard had this idea that there had to be some way to change the pattern quickly and easily within the cloth, the fabric that was being woven. It was not an easy process, and so, so Jacquard invented this idea of <clears throat> reusable cards that oriented the pins to select the threads to be woven into the fabric. And so you could remove the card and put in a separate card and it would weave a different pattern. You could remove that card and enter another card and it would change the pattern yet again. These wooden cards are kind of like the paper roll of the player piano. And each time you put that paper roll in there, the player piano will play a different song. And these were actually the prototype for the punch, card, the punch cards that IBM was going to use for their tabulating machines that we'll be talking about. And this is the first time that we find that um, computing is going beyond just the boundaries of mathematics. And so this loom gave us the idea of a stored program, these reusable cards. So we're going to move to 1823, and we're going to talk about a man named Charles Babbage. He created a difference engine. He was building upon Pascal and Leibniz's ideas. Babbage designed a prototype of a difference engine that would add, subtract, and multiply huge six-digit numbers. He abandoned a dif difference engine in 1825, and he, apply or he designed something called the analytic engine. It included four critical components that we know of in our modern day computers. The first one is some kind of an input device, some way to get instructions into this machine or this engine. An output device is, was some way to know what the calculations um, resulted in. Then a central processing unit that would somehow affect or execute the instructions. And then finally memory, some way to store the instructions in the engine itself. Unfortunately, Babbage was never able to complete either one of these concept engines that he created. And in 1985, the Science Museum in London set out to construct a working difference engine built faithfully to Babbage's original design from 1847 to 1849. <clears throat> they wanted to use only the components that Babbage would have had available to him at the time. The project took 17 years to complete. The calculating section was finished in 1991 in time for the bicentennial of Babbage's birth. And the thing that was so surprising about it was that it actually worked. If he had been able to create that difference engine or that analytic engine in 1823, imagine where our technology would be today. So let's move to 1843 to a woman named Ada Lovelace Byron. She was a contemporary of Babbage, and she suggested some instructions that he could use with his analytic engine. She is considered the first programmer. She conceived the idea of a program loop, and because of her contributions, a language, a programming language is named after her. You may be familiar with a language called 
Ada. In 1890, a man named Her Herman Hollerith created a tabulating machine. He worked for the U.S. Census Bureau, and he realized that they wouldn't be able to finish tabulating the results of the 1890 census before the next census was taken. <clears throat> so he created this electromechanical counting machine that used punch cards. Think back to that loom. And because of the success of this single-purpose machine, he created a company called the International Business Machines Corporation, which you might know as IBM. All right, so let's move to 1937 with the Mark I. <clears throat> Benjamin Barak built a machine with electronic relay switches based on the work of Charles Sanders Pierce, who realized that you could use electric switches to emulate the true and false condition of Boolean algebra. And implementing the design, he built the Mark I in 1937. It used electronic switches and vacuum tubes. It was 50 feet long, <clears throat> had a drive shaft powered by a five horsepower electronic mo um, motor that was mechanically synchronizing hundreds of electromagnetic relays. Unfortunately, it was obsolete by the time of its introduction because of the advent of the, uh, the expansion of the vacuum tube. So in 1943, we see the ENIAC, which stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, created by the U.S. Navy to help calculate gun trajectories. It ran a thousand times as the fast as the Mark I. It was a 30-ton machine that filled a huge basement and had 6,000 switches and 18,000 vacuum tubes. There was one team whose only purpose was to replace the vacuum tubes all day long. There was another team who spent all day long flipping switches to perform a simple arithmetic operations. The memory could hold a whopping 20 10-digit numbers at the same time. Are you amazed yet? Unfortunately, it had to be programmed externally. Remember that team that was flip flipping switches? This brings us to John von Neumann. He built upon Babbage's concept of a machine, the computing machine, that would need four main components, an input, an output, a memory of some kind, and then a processor that would uh, execute the instructions. And our modern-day machines are called um, von Neumann machines because of those four um, categories of devices. 1944 brings us to the EDVAC, which stands for Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer. It's called the Von Neumann machine. It was built upon that architecture that Von Neumann um, <clears throat> expanded upon with Charles Babbage. It also included a stored program concept. The idea is that computers can be operated by a program that is loaded into memory. This also implies that programs can be stored somewhere and repeatedly loaded into memory and that programs itself, like other data, can be modified. This EDVAC could store a huge number of 44-bit words. A thousand 44-bit words could be stored in memory. All right, this is going to lead us to 1946 and car phones. Western Electric and the Bell System in the St. Louis area <clears throat> created a car phone. The original equipment weighed 80 pounds and it consumed too much power to allow its use without the automobile's engine running. There were initially only three channels for all of the users in the St. Louis area. So, you thought the mobile phones were a relatively new thing? There were car phones in the mid-1940s. Um, the end of the 1940s brings us Grace Murray Hopper, Admiral Hopper, this is the reason why, Admiral Hopper is the reason why we call computer bugs glitches. Excuse me, computer glitches, we call them bugs. Because she is reported to have found a moth in one of the electromagnetic relays, and she taped it to the logbook. And that is why we call them bugs. And you can see a picture of the bug that she taped into the logbook. She was um, very, very instrumental in... <clears throat> And computer science as we know it today. She created the programming language COBOL, which is still being used in the mainframe environment today. And this is going to bring us up to World War II. So we're going to stop here and take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll learn about World War II.